Good morning, everyone. Good morning. We're noting how horrible we look on this screen, but that's okay. It's just vanity, right? Yes, that's right. It's the lighting. The lighting is not very attractive. Beauty is uh, skin deep, right? That <laughs> that's right. Um, I'd like to, um, my name is Leah Walker, and I am of Danish, English, and Nakatma ancestry. My kinship ties are with um, Stalo um, and Nakatma people at Seabird Island. And I'm really happy to um, meet you all on video conference or webinar and to welcome you to um, where we are hosting this circle, which is on the traditional territory of the Musqueam and Squamish people. Mm -hmm. And um, I'd like to acknowledge this place, and it is a wonderful place. Today, we are very lucky to have the beautiful Denise Findlay of Quay Quay Consulting um, here. And I'm just going to read this little introduction. Many of you have it, but just so you can get yourself set up. And then I'll lay out uh, the format of our circle. So we have quite a few, few people on webinar. There is going to be... Um, a PowerPoint, and I will answer the questions for those guests that are on webinar right now. And um, I said that I would do that second, but I'm going to do that first. So what's going to happen is um, Denise is also very open to taking questions uh, throughout, and she will pause at certain points just to check. And if you want to ask a question, if you're on video conference, the best thing to do is to unmute your mic um, or wave, and, and we'll acknowledge you, and then unmute your mic, and, um, and that would be great. And then ask the question, and then make sure that you mute your mic again. And I've noticed that all of you figured out where your mic is, so it is off right now while this one is on. And for those of you on webinar, I will be keeping track of, of your questions and at appropriate moments when, before Denise gets too far into her presentation, we'll ask them for you. So hopefully that'll be okay. Um, Denise is a First Nations facilitator from Squamish. Squamish Nation. Squamish yeah. Nation. And she's a, a parent of two boys and a wife. I, for, I always forget to part the put that as part of my identity, but that's important. pretty important, um, who weaves together years of professional and personal experience working with people. Her education is an integration of various disciplines in the human development field. And you've been working in First Nations communities for a while yeah, now? Yeah, quite, quite some time, probably about 10 years. Awesome. Yeah, I think. I'm so glad to Maybe meet you. So she's really, in, you're really interested in capacity development and um, bullying and community engagement and lateral violence. And, and that is sort of, I just love how our communities are really wanting to tackle that. Mm -hmm. It's a hot and topic. It's a very hot topic, and it's an ongoing process, right? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I certainly realize for even my own personal work, it's ongoing. It's a life journey. No so quick fixes. No quick fixes. And today, um, Denise is going to come at it possibly from a different way than you've experienced this, if any of you have done any lateral violence um, workshops, or done any reading on it. <laughs> it's beyond. Could you mute your mic, please? Your, thank you. Awesome. <laughs> we heard the mic go. Yeah, a little scratchy. Yeah. So um, I'm really interested to hearing about what you have to say. So welcome. Thank you. Thank you. I'm very happy to be here. Um, I just love to have the opportunity to share uh, my particular uh, perspective and approach on um, some of the challenges that our communities experience. Uh, and um, this is probably the most efficient way to reach a large audience, and it's also odd to be speaking into a camera and not to have that human touch uh, that, that I like so much. Um, but I've endeavored to put a presentation together today to be able to um, outline or at least at least have you walk away with some insight um, about this particular topic. That's my goal. It's it's there I don't generally work with strategies 
Um, there's no quick fixes, but certainly if I can provide insight to people and I can, I can just create a little bit of a pivot in the way you're thinking and looking um, and that you're able to see things differently, that will generally inform how you respond. Uh, so that's the most important thing. Um, I am, um, I belong to the Squamish Nation. I am living on reserve there, raising my family. Uh, I have my own business, which is called Quay Quay Consulting, and that uh, in my language means, it's a, it's a word that means to talk and to discuss. Uh, and I have traveled all over Canada to many different communities um, facilitating community workshops, working with leadership teams. Uh, and I also work in my own community, which is a huge honor. Uh, I work with our families there. Um, and mostly, mostly families where um, there's, it's high risk in terms of um, you know, child protection issues and things like that. And it's been a huge learning curve for me. Uh, but it certainly has provided me with even more insight into how to work with some of the very complex problems in our community, communities. Um, and they are complex and the dynamics are thick. And I find that we can get very caught up in all of the things that we can't actually do a lot about. So hopefully today you'll walk away with some insight around where to focus your energies because most people working in communities, it's draining. There is a high level of burnout. It is a, it is a huge commitment and it requires huge dedication. And most people doing the work, they have huge hearts. Um, that's to me the good news that people people engage just have huge hearts and huge commitment but there is a high level of burnout so um, I want to also acknowledge in terms of my own training and experience um, Dr. Gordon Neufeld and his uh, research and body of work has hugely influenced um, my particular approach and so I you will hear me talk about him and you'll also see um, there's some slides that I'm using um, that belong to him uh, that I'm authorized to to work with in my in my work but I am uh, studying with the Neufeld Institute and I'm studying something called developmental attachment theory and it is a theory that makes a lot of sense to me when I look at healing, the healing process in our communities and what has happened in terms of the trauma, uh, the intergenerational effects of res residential school, the wounding and how that's still showing up for us today in, there's many manifestations and so uh, it's really provided me with some concrete insight into what some of the root causes are um, and how we need to work with it. So I'll share some of that as well, but I just needed to acknowledge Dr. Gordon Neufeld and his work because um, it's just given me so much and, I, and I've and i labeled the slides that um, come from the Neufeld Institute, just so you know, all right? Um, if anyone has any questions at this point for me, I'm happy to, I'm happy to answer before we move on. Okay, good. Um, so what makes my particular approach a little bit different, I know that there's, there's different ways of looking at this topic of lateral violence. Lateral violence, violence, uh, displaced aggression, whatever you want to call it uh, and how it shows up in its, it, in its many manifestations and forms, my particular approach is a developmental approach and that means that I'm really looking at what root causes what are the root causes and tracing it back to the beginnings and being able to intervene um, at, at those places. Those are the best interventions. I know that, I know that there's other approaches out there that would, would take more of an outside in approach, which means we'd be looking at trying to manage behaviors and control behaviors from the outside. And in my experience, um, those interventions are not all that successful. Um, they're short-lived and they're superficial and they don't get to the root. I also believe that um, at the end of the day, uh, as my grandma would say, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. So where we can be intervening with the younger generations, I think that that is um, a place we need to be focusing a lot of our energies at this point in order to break the cycle. So you'll hear me talking about root causes. I think sometimes, uh, people sometimes love what I have to say and I think other times when people are looking for answers about things, it can be frustrating because I don't have any, I'm not black and white about this. I don't have black and white answers. I'm really, 
<sighs> this is a Gordon Newfeld saying, but I'm trying to give you a map, not directions. <laughs> and if you think about the difference between those two things, um, if I give you directions, it's it's only going to get you from point A to point B. If I provide a map, that's going to help you orient yourself, figure out where you are in the grand scheme of things. And with a map, you can figure out how to get anywhere. And to me, that, that that's more capacity building. Giving a set of directions or a set of strategies that only works in one context is not all that useful. Um, so it's more about giving the map. And so, so for those of you who want directions, I might frustrate you a little bit, but um, hopefully you'll eventually find the map analogy useful. Right. Is there anything, any questions at all yet? No? no? Okay, good. There we go. So this is a slide that I love to share. Uh, it was given to me by a friend quite a few years ago who knew about the body of work that I was getting into. Um, and I've heard different stories about this. I, I've heard that, you know, they are unknown people, but I've heard some people in my community say that they are some of our ancestors. Um, but I, what I like to do is just ask people what you see when you look at this picture. And if you could just type in your, you know, anyone who wants to comment on this, that would be wonderful. Just tell me what it is that you notice, what stands out to you the most about this particular picture. And for those of you on video conference, you're welcome to just um, unmute yeah. and speak. That'd be great. I certainly see uh, young. I see the young and the old. I see teachings. So that's what I love to see, mm -hmm. the child in there, mm -hmm. in the middle, taken care of. Yeah. So that's the first thing I notice. And I have here, someone said, spearing for food, family working together, role modeling, balance, mm -hmm. yeah. circle of life, grandparents raising children, yeah. and the children mimicking the adult. Yes. 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 Oh, oh, good, good, good stuff. Yes. Yes. All of the above. And it looks like there's waiting and patience, too, because the water is calm and they're very, they're yeah. poised. Yeah. Yeah. It's just, it's such a different way of life. And as my, my Auntie Jackie, one of my elders, who I respect very much, would say, there was a time where we, we worked to live, we didn't work for money. We were not a role-based society. We were a relationally-based society. And we lived and worked together. Um, we didn't send our kids off to strangers to be taught. We, we grew together and we worked alongside of each other. And everything was done to facilitate caretaking and dependence on each other. And this was how we survived. Uh, and our children learned, we, we learned from each other by being with and doing with and togetherness. And that this was the preeminent need. Here's someone's. Pardon me? Okay, so someone um, on video conference has their microphone on and it's very scratchy. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> so it just is indicative of a different way of life and that we have, I mean, we can't turn back time. Here we are. Um, but I think it speaks to a very different way of learning and living together. And although we live in a modern society today, our need for connection <laughs> and yeah. our, our need for uh, togetherness is actually still a very preeminent need. Uh, there's been all sorts, I mean, it, it, over uh, throughout history, there's been all sorts of brilliant people who have theorized about the importance of togetherness, contact, and closeness. But all the new research uh, in terms of neuroscience is validating 
what many traditional cultures already knew, and that is that um, mammals seek contact and closeness before they even seek food. Um, that is the preeminent need. And so this is something, we just live a different lifestyle now. We are a role-based society. We work for money. We do not work to live necessarily anymore. And we are not living in attachment villages in which everyone feels like they're on the same side. And as a result of that, there is, there's a lot of suffering. And of course, this all stems from colonization and residential school. Uh, so my particular approach is all about um, drawing our attention back to this preeminent need of togetherness um, and a way of being with each other um, that will allow and actually enable us, support us, our children, to come to a place of rest and, and ultimately from there, growth and development happens. And, and only through that process of development will we overcome some of the social, societal barriers that we experience. Uh, and in regards to lateral violence, the conflicts we experience, um, you know, everything from, from suicide to bullying to um, violence can be sort of explained as a result of this breakdown. Or any questions? Yeah. No, just comments about um, about what this what's on the slide. So more harmony and balance. <clears throat> um, someone was talking about how it looked like it was just post um, World War II because of the mm -hmm. clothes, but yeah. um, fishing in a in a traditional way. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And this togetherness. And I I often look at this and I wonder. Well, those could be the parents. They could be the grandparents. It could be the aunts. It could be the uncles. Um, it, it doesn't really matter all that much. Mm -hmm. There's this, there's this uh, togetherness happening and a working together and a modeling and a teaching. Uh, and you can just see the teaching that's happening there that that little boy is emulating the older man and that this is the most powerful form of learning that there is, is when we are attached to each other uh, we are in good relationship with each other that learning is uh, it happens quite spontaneously, not necessarily uh, through book learning or going to a classroom, but there's a whole other kind of learning in terms of uh, caring, being together, living together that happens uh, in the context of our relationships with each other in our families and in our communities. I, I also wanted to take a moment to just address um, some other theories that are out there. And I, and I know that they're out there um, because I hear people saying these things and there certainly are other experts who believe in these particular theories. Um, and when we think about theories, uh, the test of any good theory is that it is able to consistently explain things clearly, that there's a lack of uh, contrary information, information out there, um, and that there's clear implications for, for putting it into practice. That's how you test a good theory. So yes, there are tons of different theories out there, but whenever you're looking at any kind of a theory, you need to sort of be asking yourself that. Does it make sense? Does it help me make sense of something that I couldn't make sense of before? Um, is there a lack of that con contrary info out there? Is, there? is there research out there that contradicts the information? And can I put it into practice? And for me, with the developmental theory and the, the attachment theory, this makes a lot of sense to me. Uh, there is not a lot of contradictory information, and there are clear implications for putting it into practice. So it's, it's been wonderful for me to have this and to be able to share some concrete insights with people. So the other theories out there is that it's all to do with power and that there's a power imbalance and people are hungry for power and that power is the preeminent need. And we hear this a lot. It's all about power and control. And absolutely, there are people who are seeking for power, uh, but it is not the preeminent need. Often, those seeking for power have not had their need for togetherness, contact, and closeness met in the early years. And it sort of yeah. gets misguided. Okay. Um, someone's mic. Uh, so I have a question here. 
Um, and I don't, or maybe I should just let you go through these Absolutely, theories. Yeah. Um, well, and well then let's hear it and then I'll see Here's the question. So um, one question is a Western definition of how, how about one based in traditional knowledge theory? Well, traditional knowledge theory has everything to do with relationship and spirit and spiritual connection um, and being together and certainly to come in or it, it, spirituality is a product of development as well because we have to be able to fantasize a god or a creator before we can connect with one and so in terms of stuckness developmentally uh, not everyone's able to make that connection not because it's not there and it's not possible but because they're they've been sidetracked so absolutely that's part of it these are the theories that I'm these are the theories I'm dispelling here mm -hmm. yeah. but I would say that everything that I talk about in terms of attachment and relationship is in alignment with traditional values and it certainly is in my community um, for those of you who don't know this, I, Gordon Neufeld was given the uh, International Circle, Circle of Courage Award because his particular approach was so in alignment with traditional values mm. as well. And I, I, the feedback I've been given since I've been doing this work in my own community is that never before have we seen such a, a shift within our with within our parents that I'm working with and our caregivers so I think the proof again proof is in the pudding um, yes but thank you that's a great question it is absolutely question. very very valid and very very important um, so the power and balance uh, theory is is um, there's all sorts of contradictory information power and the seeking for power is not a preeminent need it is it is the need for togetherness that is the preeminent need that trumps this and there's been all kinds of studies done on this the other theory um, is that lateral violence and bullying and things like that is a learned behavior and that it can be unlearned again there's all kinds of contradictory information out there around this you cannot if you think about it this way you cannot teach someone to be caring it's almost impossible you can't teach empathy it is instinctual we are born with the um, ability to care we are creatures that have a limbic system we care deeply it is only when there's been significant wounding um, and there's been no safe place for us to heal that we become hardened and we lose this instinct to care and so we can teach people how to act like they care mm -hmm. I really want to make this distinction because this is where we get confused even with our children we can teach a child or we can teach someone when they need to say sorry and how they need to say sorry and how to act as if they're sorry for something but we cannot make someone feel sorry and this is this is where we're getting off track and so it doesn't have to do with teaching people how to be more caring it has to do with softening um, with creating safety for people uh, with a healing that needs to come and certainly um, spirituality and culture um, play huge roles in this for people in creating creating an environment in which growth can occur spontaneously and people can get their soft hearts back this is part of where we've gone wrong the other thing I hear people talk about in terms of youth is this entitlement theory that um, we have spoiled brats and they need to be you know <laughs> taught a lesson uh, that they feel entitled to everything and again there's all sorts of contradictory information here um, youth and peer culture where there's this hardening that's happened and there is a depersonalization of the relationship needs that our children have become um, more focused on material items uh, in many ways we've aided and abetted this process in in our in the way that we parented and and uh, they've lost touch with their need for togetherness as well togetherness is a very vulnerable thing um, and if there's been significant wounding and they're within the relationships uh, it is something that um, it feels very unsafe 
it feels very risky and it feels very unsafe. And for many of our children, they've become quite peer oriented and their attention is going elsewhere. It's, it's, not, it's not instinctive for them anymore. They're not going to their parents, their grandparents, their aunts and uncles, their teachers for contact and closeness. It, they're going to each other and it's the first time in history that we've ever had a peer culture. Traditional living, traditional lifestyles, if you look back, um, when we were living more tribally, there were not enough children for there to be peer orientation. The children were in a hierarchy and they were taking care, the older kids were taking care of the younger kids and so there were these caretaking relationships. Now we just have this sort of flat um, peer culture and there's this thing that Gordon Neufeld calls tribalization because there's no hierarchy, there's no pecking order, there's no one in that leadership role um, that the youth are taking their cues from and the frustration is high. Um, they have very little maturity in order to manage their emotions and it is a breeding ground for violence. Uh, one of the other theories is that there's been this loss of empathy and there certainly has been a loss of empathy. Um, but I just want to say, and actually there's some recent studies that show that kids today Youth today, adolescents today, have 80% less empathy than they did 20 years ago. 20 years ago? Yes. Oh my gosh. And um, what are we doing? Yeah, oh it's gosh. a big, it's a red flag. It's absolutely a red flag. The other, the other statistic that is quite um, frightening is that one in every five girls will be cutting and burning themselves by the time they're about 12 years old. And every time I say that in community, I see everyone going, it's happening here, it's happening here, it's happening here. So it's something we really need to look at. It, it extends far beyond um, some of the surface issues that we, we think are related to this issue. We tend to think organizationally, we tend to think the bullying sort of stuff, but it is, a, it is big. And right. I really want people to get the bigness of it. it it's not compartmentalized just here. Yeah. It is a big problem. Yeah. Um, but in terms of empathy, again, it is not something we can teach. We have all kinds of programs that are out there. Um, roots of Empathy, ro and Yes, yeah. and Roots of Empathy is a wonderful program. I love that program. And it works, but it, it's, um, it has more to do with bringing out the caring instincts of the children for the child, for the baby. Mm -hmm. And again, in a hierarchy. Right. Right? right, in this caregiving mode, so that we're bringing this out in the child to care for someone that is uh, more vulnerable than they are, and so that's a whole different thing. That's that's working with an instinct as opposed to trying to teach empathy from the outside in. Mm. Let's talk about empathy. Let's try to teach empathy. It's not really something that we can teach. It's in us. It's inherent. It's instinctive. Um, we're born this way, we lose touch with it, the instinct gets sort of twisted along the way with the hardening that happens. And that's a result of wounding. Any questions so far? Nope, not okay. here yet. Okay. Any comments? Um, a comment. I think it's important, some really good comments here. I think it's important to recognize that what happens in our communities is a symptom of what, of the mainstream society that we live in. Mm -hmm. uh, well, absolutely. Yeah. These problems exist in the mainstream as of well. Of course, yeah, not, it's everywhere. Not just in our communities. Um, what I will go on to talk about, though, is that when you're, we're talking about any society that has been wounded, when you're working with a wounded population, it could be, you know, uh, uh, First Nations communities, it could be, um, the delinquent community. It could, um, you know, be a number of other communities. Maybe the the disabled community. Any any community that's vulnerable, you see a higher level of frustration there. Yeah. Um, for a lot of good reasons, and so I will talk about that as we as we go. Most certainly. Yeah. There's just more. There's more challenges there. Hmm. Oh, and one more comment. There are scores of examples in mainstream society, government policies, media. Yeah, you got that right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, absolutely. And we all kind of get sucked into it yeah. and lose our way, right? Yes. Well, yeah. it's, again, you know, when I, whenever I sit and talk with, with people from my community, elders from my community, I am reminded of the different lifestyle, the, the traditional lifestyle that we once had. And 
Western society, I'm going to just say Western society, um, they're often referred to as the tearless population but there's sort of this lack of emotion there. We are geared up in Western society more for materialism. We're a role-based society. We're very attached to our roles, and um, our energy is going, it's different priorities, making money, um, material items, advancement, winning, uh, and these are these are values that are being passed on to our children. Mm. Uh, and I... It, it, so it just speaks again to the bigness, the bigness of it. And I, it's not about making wrong, but I think it's just about noticing. And I have some wonderful people, directors and chief and council that I, I know in my own community that are very much about returning to um, a more traditional way of working and living. And that that in itself is a work in progress. Mm -hmm. It's how do we how do we exist in a modern day world, and return to a more caring um, uh, sort of village, what I call an attachment village lifestyle, where we are working all together and we're all on the same side. And that's one of the things our kids are missing that they had traditionally was that everyone in the village was on the same side for survival purposes. Yes. that's not the experience of our children anymore. No, there's it's so not. much division. Yeah. All right, um, so I want to talk about attachment. And attachment um, is really a fancy word for love. And attachment is a term that um, came out in the 50s by a guy named John Bowlby. Uh, and he knew that it was love, but he knew that um, he would not be accepted in the scientific community <laughs> as legitimate if he... Uh, said he wanted to study love and so oh he called it he called it attachment and that's where attachment was born oh. uh, attachment theory but there was all sorts of people before that and certainly traditionally we knew that this was a preeminent need um, and so when you think about attachment it's love it's also the science of relationship and it is um, a drive or relationship characterized by the pursuit and preservation of proximity. Now I want to clarify that because what that really means is that these are very primitive drives deep in our in our primitive brain that are moving us all the time. Our need for togetherness is is a preeminent need and what that means is that it is before anything else even before food, and there's been all kinds of studies done on this that prove this to be true. There were studies done with monkeys actually where, um, because there was someone, um, some other uh, theorist, I can't remember the name right now, that um, a behaviorist, uh, maybe it was Skinner, it doesn't matter, who said that uh, food, the only reason babies were attached to their moms was for food. And so they did these experiments with these poor little monkeys and they, they took, they made one monkey made out of sort of metal and they put food near that, that pretend mama monkey and then they made another pretend mama monkey that was made out of soft fabrics, no food. And then they would put the poor monkeys under duress, it's awful. And where do you think the monkey, the little baby monkey would go? The soft. The soft one, not for the food ever. Not for the one with the food ever that was, that was just metal and rigid and... Wow. Yeah, so it, it, it dispelled that particular theory, and um, uh, so that, that sort of proves how, how uh, preeminent a need togetherness is. And if you think about traditional lifestyle, um, you know, we needed to stay together for survival. And I'm not just talking about indigenous or First Nations cultures, but any traditional culture that, that we lived in tribes because that togetherness ensured survival. Yeah. If anyone wandered off from the tribe, there was an instant reaction uh, to bring that person back in closer for that child or that person to come back in close. And this was a survival instinct. Now, it's still driving us today, and I often will use this example. It's almost like the fish doesn't notice the water. Like, the fish does not question the water, doesn't notice the water, is not aware of the water. But you take the fish out of the water, you take the water away, and the fish is suffering and won't survive. And so attachment's kind of like that. We don't notice what's actually driving us a lot of the time. So think about it that way. It's a drive deep within you, and it's moving you all the time. Um, 
Any questions about that one? No. Okay, good. So this is Dr. Gordon Neufeld's um, piece of work. It is uh, an amazing diagram that explains so very much. I have sat in a course with him for five days where we've only talked about this. Wow. For about you know eight or so hours a day. And so we can go quite deep with it, but it, it, it's a beautiful map of how we grow and development, develop in terms of connection, contact, and closeness. And so I'm going to just go through it very, very briefly because I think it's important. We can't really talk about lateral violence and violence unless we understand ideally how development's supposed to unfold and where we get off track at okay. some point. Um, so if you think about on top of the soil, this is like a plant and the roots underneath, and on top of the soil, uh, is the plant and often when we're looking at each other when things aren't going well the plants not growing the way it's supposed to or maybe it's not looking all that healthy we tend to only look at the plant itself mm -hmm. but we very rarely look underneath at the root structure and that is actually where we need to be looking and working to make sense of things mm -hmm. is that that particular root structure and so these are attachment roots. They're meant to happen. And from birth till around seven, we never lose any of these. We only deepen and build on them see as the we diagram? grow. Excuse me. We oh, can't do see you the not diagram. See the, oh, you can't the see diagram? the diagram? Yeah. All we see is the words. Oh, OK. Oh. I don't know what's happening there. We'll do our, just stay with us and we'll, we'll work behind the scenes. But what it is, maybe we can just describe it for you. It's, it's do you want to describe it? I will. So <laughs> it's, it's, like a, it's like a plant on the top of the soil and then underneath the soil are seven roots. And these are attachment roots um, that develop over the first seven years of life if all goes well. They are sequential. They're meant to unfold in seven sequential steps. I'm going to describe each one of them briefly. They, we never lose any of them. We only deepen them. Um, and sometimes if we're wounded, we can regress and we can lose some of them, but then we can get them back. Um, if there's been significant wounding, people get stuck and don't ultimately develop them all. They can become very problematic in terms of relationships. And so they are... They, they're the capa they represent the capacity for relationship at different stages of development and relationship being a preeminent need um, and very tightly connected to development. They now know this. So the first root is a shallow, like the bulb. Um, it, it is uh, attachment through the senses and that's when a child is born between zero and one. Um, we have to be with our caregiver in sight, sound, taste, smell, touch um, for that first year of life in order for the brain to develop and for the, for the limbic system to stay healthy, which is where all our vulnerable emotions live, okay? That's important because our emotional brain is what drives higher development. And that means in order to grow up, to be civilized, to have a good temper, uh, to, to be able to navigate complex relationships, to, to be able to control one's impulses, we need to have a really healthy limbic system. And so those needs to be, need to be met between zero and one. And certainly we have that need for contact, physical contact and closeness for all our life, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Some of us more than others. Now, if that goes well between the age of one and two, the root of sameness starts to develop, and that means that we start to find things, we want to be like each other. And this is also present in adult interactions where we look to be the, be the same and to be alike. I say to people, if you, um, first of all, the first step in relationships is you first have to want to be with each other. If you don't want to be with each other, that's a big problem. <laughs> the second thing is, is you have to at some point find something that you have in common. You have to find some likeness with each other. So important. If we can't find that, we're, we get very, very stuck. There's not a lot of motivation to make that relationship work. From around the age of uh, between one and two, we develop the capacity 
um, for belonging and loyalty. And so we attach with this root, and that means that we start to uh, become possessive and take ownership of those people that we're connected to. And they start. we look to belong to them. We look for them to take ownership over us. We also give loyalty to those that we're attached to. And those three roots are superficial. They're, they're in black because, as Dr. Newfeld would say, your dog will develop those roots. <laughs> your dog and your cat will. Any creature with a limbic system will develop those roots. But where do you think, if there's been significant wounding, people get stuck in, in their growth? Right there at those three particular roots love being known and significance. Yeah, so our relationships begin to revolve around just being with, being like, and That's it. you belong and you're loyal. And that means that there's no room for healthy individuation and being different and being your own person and venturing forth. You compromise your place in the grand scheme of things when your relationships revolve around that. Most um, but pure culture is all about those three. And that's why it's so wounding. There's no room for, for a child to become their own person in that, in that environment. So from there, uh, at around the age of three, we start to seek significance. We start to seek to matter to each other. We seek to matter to our parents. Um, and we all, we all have this, this need. It is, again, an attachment need that we have throughout our entire life to seek to matter. There is a difference between feeling like we have to work to matter and feeling like we matter, believing that we matter. And so many people get on, a, get on this track of feeling like they have to work and exhaust themselves trying, working for significant and becoming very frustrated when they can't achieve it. Um, and we see this. That root is in gray because it is very, very, very vulnerable. If this need wasn't met growing up, the root would have not been able to grow mm -hmm. and establish. And I, I often will use this analogy and say, so if a plant doesn't have nice deep ro ro roots, it won't grow very big, mm -hmm. will it? No. You're right. It won't grow very big. We have to be able to put those roots down. And it has to be safe enough for us to put those roots down. That's the thing. It has to be safe enough. If it feels like there's going to be wounding, the roots won't, they won't take place place. They won't, the plant won't take root. So from there, at around the age of four, we develop the capacity to love. And this is when you'll see a person or a child give their heart away. There will be a liking that starts to happen. People think that children love them out of the womb, and it's a capacity that develops over time. And certainly, if you think of adult relationships, we have to be with the person for a while, and we have to find something in common, and then we have to sense of belonging and loyalty and then we fall in love naturally that's what should happen mm -hmm. um, when it feels safe enough to give one's heart the heart will be given again a very vulnerable route um, and I know for even my own self I'll use my own self as an example because of my own uh, life's journey and the wounding that I've uh, experienced in my life when I start to like and get like somebody um, it also occurs to me that I want that person to like me back, and that's a big risk. And so it's, it's far easier for me to act like I don't care than it is for me to show some liking. I'm aware of this, and I, I, I'm steeped in this stuff, and yet I still do it. So it's not a logical, it's not logical, you see. Yeah, we, we, we go at this from a logical place. We, we come at lateral violence and these problems from a logical place. But the truth is, is most of uh, the root causes, are they're coming from a very illogical part of the brain, an emotional part of the brain. And then ultimately the most vulnerable root um, being known and understood, which is another word for psychological intimacy, uh, develops around the age of seven for sensitive kids a little bit later. Um, and this is where we seek to be known. Um, we don't want to have secrets from the people that we're attached to. Uh, we discover that we, are, we don't even know ourselves. We're a work in progress, and we're always seeking to be known by those people that we're in relationship with. Now, not everyone makes it here. Many of us stay stuck at those superficial roots. And I'll talk as we go about how that ties into lateral violence and how that ties into um, the aggression problems that we have. Okay? So this is a, just, how, I'm not going to talk much about this. I'll just let you have a peek at it. Um, these are the six themes of separation. So when we 
face separation at any of those roots, these are, this is the way we face it. These are the themes that we experience where wounding takes place that make it hard for the roots to take hold. Mm -hmm. I usually, when people look at this, I usually see a lot of nodding heads. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and you can, if you look at this, you can start to make sense of maybe children in your life, family in your life, people that you know, also yourself. Because if we've been wounded at any of those places, that way of relationship will be very tough for us. When it comes to that, those places, it will become very tough. There'll be, you'll feel the strain mm -hmm. and the discomfort. Mm -hmm. Any questions? No. Good. <clears throat> so some of the big wounding uh, interactions that affect our ability to establish those roots and to grow and reach our full potential, um, to become people who are mature, uh, who are able to navigate conflicts, who, are, who have the capacity for emotional and psychological intimacy and togetherness, um, these are some of the things that get in the way of that and interfere with that process and that um, means places where we've faced too much separation where uh, we've either faced too much physical separation, emotional separation, or psychological separation, where there's been too much shame growing up, where we've ma been made to feel like there's something wrong with us um, just by virtue of who we are, uh, feeling too unsafe um, emotionally, physically, and psychologically. Uh, that peer orientation I talked about, incredibly wounding, and we have so many of our youth that are caught up in peer orientation um, that are being so very wounded. And by wounded by their peers or by their peers. Yeah. And because there's a lack of relationship with the with the parents or the grandparents or the, the people who are supposed to be providing the care. They don't even go to those people. They're seeking all of their needs to be met by their peers. And they So you think we're making yeah. a mistake by allowing them to do that? Well, it's, it's not, interesting because I all, yeah. isn't it a developmental stage as well? Is my question. Yeah, because oh yeah, yeah. The, you know, like the teenage yeah. brain in particular, it's yeah. all about not necessarily. It is in some ways about separating, yeah. and because the people that you're going to be surviving with mm -hmm. are your peers yeah. and not the people that are older than you necessarily. So, yeah. Yeah. so there's nothing wrong with socialization. That's important, mm -hmm. but we've made the mistake that the, the way to help a child reach maturity is early socialization, mm -hmm. as opposed to having that child develop nice deep roots in their relationship with us, becoming their own person, fully individuated, where they can now go into their peer group and not lose themselves mm -hmm. with that particular group. Right. So we've pushed it too soon, and children are losing themselves. Okay. Um, they can't hold on to themselves, they can't hold on to their family, their traditional values, their beliefs. Right. The only way we can translate traditional values, culture, beliefs, stories is in the relationship between the younger generation and the older generation and what's happening is what you'll notice is youth who are peer oriented are very invested in keeping those two groups apart. Mm -hmm. They're not interested in hanging out with the older generation and learning anything. They are completely separate and invested in that. So it, I often will ask when I'm talking to parents, it's like, is your child benefiting from the social interaction they're having or is it causing them to be in a state of alarm? Are they, con are they completely preoccupied with their peer relationships? And do you feel like you've lost your child? Have they changed? Has their whole person, have they become hardened? Those are some of the telltale signs. Mm -hmm. So it's just, it's not that it's not good. Yes. It's just the timing of it mm -hmm. and how we think that this is the answer. And mm -hmm. I think what we've done is we've normalized some of the high-risk behaviors that we see in youth. We've normalized it. We said, well, that's just teenage stuff. Um, but if you think about it, traditionally, when we did puberty rights and whatnot for mm -hmm. boys and even for girls, they're, you know, 
it was based, it wasn't at the same age for every child. No. And there needed to be certain things, signs showing that that child was ready. And it usually had um, something to do with a ritual around courage. Now, we don't have, our kids today, it's not about courage, it's about fearlessness. Yeah. Yeah. And high risk behavior. It's yeah. a completely different, like, yeah. So we're treating what's normal. We're saying this is normal, but is that natural? Probably not. Not so much. And the other thing is, some of us are just born more sensitive. We're born into the world with very, very thin skin, and we feel everything. And I'm one of those people, and I know that some of you out there will be able to identify. And that we had to defend, like we had to, you know, harden a little bit just to get through, um, because life was just too much. Yeah. And there's still people like this today. And and if you think about autistic uh, kids or people, they're highly sensitive, highly, highly sensitive. All right. So some of the things that um, have affected Aboriginal or in Indigenous people, um, you know, residential school was huge. Uh, it was an environment where children were ripped out of their attachments. Um, they were shamed for who they were. They were, and um, it was an incredibly restrictive environment where there was no room for any sort of emotion any sort of upset and so there would have been no choice but to harden the heart and uh, for the brain to just filter out any vulnerable emotions and so there would have been some st resulting stuckness and from the research I've done um, the the children that were taken a little bit uh, you know the first round the older kids fared much better than later on when they started to take the children younger and younger because the younger ones couldn't hold on. Mm. They couldn't hold on to their families. They couldn't hold on to what they'd been taught. And so they just went into this defensive mode. Um, and so the wounding the wounding for the younger ones was much worse. Uh, certainly oppression and, and um, the reservation life and all of the restrictions that come along with that. Marginalization that is still experienced today. Uh, loss of tradition and culture loss of that attachment village and loss of all those attachment needs. None of them were being met. None of them during that time. There, there was a loss of togetherness, identity, belonging, loyalty, significance, love, and certainly there, I can imagine there was not a feeling of ever being known and understood during that time. And so one of the, one of the terms that um, I use I don't use trauma, I use wounding, and wounding is um, a term that Gordon uses uh, because I think when I use the term trauma, I think it has to be something big. Mm -hmm. And when I'm talking about wounding, it could be a whole spectrum of things. It could be a small wound or it could be a gigantic wound, but it's a little more all-encompassing. And so we're still unraveling, I, I think, I think everybody knows this. I hear people talking about it. It's like everyone acknowledges this. But to me, um, we're not looking at the more, some of these attachment wounds um, uh, as closely as we need to be in the grand scheme of things. <clears throat> and so what ended up happening is this is a, I think uh, this thing called defensive detachment is a reaction to wounding. And so um, a lot of things can trigger it, but when we feel a vulnerability that's too much to bear, which means there's an emotion in us, a vulnerable emotion, and there's been wounding in the context of the relationship, um, that the heart hardens. And that means that that emotional part of the brain, the limbic system, also filters come into play. So we lose access to our vulnerable emotions. Those just aren't negative emotions. Those are the caretaking emotions as well, because mm -hmm. we can't filter out one emotion. We lose them all. And so the filters come in. The brain basically says, well, I'm going to do what I deem necessary for this person or this child to keep them safe. I can't change their situation, but what I can do is I can I can prevent them from feeling the tearing wounds um, of separation in the con in this context. And so I'm going to put these filters in the brain. And even though the emotions are all still there, the emotions are no longer felt. 
and this leads to um, all kinds of difficulties when we lose touch with it. Uh, and so part of the work is to recognize that approaching, approaching people who are wounded and defended, um, the approach being taken needs to be one of creating an environment in which it is safe to heal. And I, I think that there are pockets uh, where this is happening. I'm not, I, I still see such a hardening um, and a resistance to vulnerability mm. uh, that can be getting in the way of this. And certainly our youth are, you can just see, and I see when I see youth walking down my street and I can see all the telltale signs of just, here is someone who's, who's faced excessive wounding and um, their, their hearts hardened. And we look at it like it, we don't understand, well, how did this happen? You know, it, it's, there was no safe place for this person or this child to, to find their tears around the things that didn't work, to have that healing process. So it's not what's ha what happens to us in life, but it's what doesn't happen in response to what happens to us, because we can't change everything that happens. We can't control every little thing. Um, but we certainly can we can provide a response that helps with the healing process. Mm -hmm. um, and so what they now know is that in order for us to be healthy and have a healthy limbic system, we actually have to find our tears around the things that don't work, that can't work, that will never work. And what you see when you see someone who's what we would call non-adaptive, and they have like perceptive behavior, which is they keep making the same mistake over and over and over and over, is that they haven't been able to accept what they can't change, what won't change, that what will never change. And for me, if I use myself as an example, there's all kinds of things every single day that I have to accept. It's not going to work. My hair is not going to work the way I want it today. <laughs> I need to have my little disappointment about that and move on. But there's also big things in life. So, there, you know, and th that, you can't push rivers and you can't command emotions, so sometimes the timing just has to be right. And I know for me, some of my relationships in my life, some of my biggies, like my parental relationships, the loss of my mother, it wasn't until I was 40-ish that I, got, I actually had my tears around it. Prior to that, I'd been preoccupied with that particular relationship, and it kept me very, very stuck. And some of you will know exactly what I'm talking about. Some of you will know exactly what I'm talking about. And so it is that process that allows healing to take place, that allows the heart to soften um, and, and gets our development back on track. And through that, we will see a decrease in frustration and violence. But let me carry on here. Mm. Some, of the, some of the problems that we see um, where there is a defensive detachment reaction are as follows. Mm. And we all know this to be true, uh, that there's been wounding here, um, there's been a hardening, and there's been a loss of vulnerable emotions, and the tears have dried up. I've heard Gordon say that in other parts of the world, we are referred to as the tearless society in North America. How does that? I think we have a hard time accepting tears. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And, uh, or we don't understand where the tears come from. But it's messy. Yeah. It's messy and it feels out of control and it's not all wrapped up in a box. And That's um, right. And you don't know necessarily how, how to solve it. Yes. All yes. right. So you always want to be able to, to, to give the pill and it would be better and you have to just accept that it's just sad. Yeah. Or it's just hard. And to feel those feelings. Absolutely. Yeah. And it's okay. And that we're going to be okay. <laughs> yeah. We're going to be okay, but it is about feeling. It's not, we cannot think our way out of this. It, we have to feel our way through it. This is what I tell people. We have to feel our way through it. We can only feel, though, if we feel safe in the context of our relationships. Oh, my gosh. I just thought of something that I just did with my daughter yesterday. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> so bad. Oh, no. Sorry for <laughs> this. But I just realized that I responded to her emotional outburst about something yeah. by just kind of walking away from it because yeah. it was too much. Mm. And then... Teenager? Young girl. Okay. Um, 10. She's 10. And then responded by appealing to her intellect 
and to separate herself yeah. from her emotion rather than just let her have it, letting her have it. So I actually intellectualized it. Whereas really, what you're telling me is that I should create space for the feelings. Let her have those feelings. Yeah. And then. Yeah. Okay. And Great. it's certainly <laughs> been true with some a lot of the oh. parents I've been working with that have had have, have experienced wounding is that you know, creating space for them to feel their feelings and creating enough safety for them that spontaneously em the emotion just starts to emerge. Right. And then they have a safe place to experience it. And from there you see this amazing growth spontaneously happen. Yeah. Um, but, you know, in terms of, in, in Western Canada, we've adopted a bit more behavioral sort of methodology and mm -hmm. they are starting to realize now there's all sorts of contrary information out there in terms of the importance of emotion um, that, you know, behaviorists say, well, think about it differently and, you know, think differently and you'll feel differently. Right. And I've been using that language. What I'm suggesting is get to the root of the problem, allow room for the emotion, and there will spontaneously be a shift in growth. Because we can, we certainly can act a certain way. We can act like we care. We can act like we're curious. We can show up in the way we think society wants us to show up. But often our inner experience is in such contrast to what we're showing on the outside. That's okay. Don't feel bad. We all, trust me, I blow it with my kids all the time. Oh my God. <laughs> I do. I do. I do. So one of the things I love that Dr. Newfold says is there's only one way to keep our children safe and that's with soft hearts and strong attachments. And that means that us adults, boy, we have to, we have to start looking at this differently. We have to start thinking about it differently. We have to approach it differently. And I think that approaching it traditionally, um, is, is so important for any community to bring in the elders, to put that hierarchy back in place, to get the, get the younger generation in touch with the older generation, to be together, to get on the same side, for goodness sakes. So important. Um, I have a question Great. from um, Crystal earlier was around, um, have you worked with community to bring um, group our elder and youth together and address some of that group wounding? Certainly we have um, elders come into almost everything we do and I know for me I, I rely heavily on my elders <laughs> that I, the couple that I um, work with and there is one that comes to my parenting group every Wednesday. She comes because she wants to. Yeah. She wants to be there because she loves what I'm sharing with the parents. She's eating it up. But her presence there is so soothing for people. And so I think that that is, wherever we can do that intergenerational um, relationship building, uh, I mean, I've, I, I've just, I've heard so many uh, people in the older generation, there's just such this, it feels like the Grand Canyon, the younger people are over here and the older generation's here. And it, we've normalized this. And I've heard people say, well, they don't, that's what kids do. They don't want to be with, but traditionally that's not true. Mm -hmm. That's not true. We would feast together. We would work together. We played together. There was connection. And if the, if the parents weren't there, then the older kids were caretaking the younger ones. And I think that that is a wonderful, wonderful way of, you know, you take kids and you put them in care, like you, you, you make them the big brother, you make them the big sister, you make them the older one. And part of what their job is to look out for the little ones and, and to, to facilitate this sort of thing. Yeah. But absolutely, Crystal, I think that we need to, to look at doing this, um, finding ways to, to bring all the generations together to be in relationship more often. Can I just ask, I take a, a pause here for a moment and ask if anyone on video conference has a question because I've been answering some of the webinar ones. So maybe we'll just take a moment for that. And I can't see you wave if you're going to wave, so you'll have to just <laughs> unmute because all I see on my screen is the PowerPoint. Okay, so I'm going to assume that there's no questions right now, and that's fine. That's Great. good. Thank you. <clears throat> um, hello. 
Oh, hello. I have a question. I have a question. Um, Thank you. Um, I was wondering, like, if you um, ask the older kids to be the older kids and play that role, um, I find down and down an end of life or closer, um, it would actually take away their childhood by doing that. You think? Yeah. I yeah, I think you're saying something so important. Thank you for bringing this up because we actually, we have to look for something that's called emergent energy in a child. So is there a readiness there? But certainly at any stage of the game, we don't want to give a child responsibilities and make them feel anxious about that. That's not the intent. But I'm talking about if you think about when, you know, let's say you have a two-year-old and you bring the baby home and you say to the two-year-old, you're a big brother. This is your little sister and she loves you so much. You can just see that two-year-old puff up with a sense of pride. And so I'm talking about priming these instincts, but certainly not saying to the older child, now you, this is your responsibility. There has to be a, an, a responsible, caring adult leading that process. That older child also needs to know who they can depend on. They can't be left hanging. So I'm glad you mentioned that because that's important. Hello? Hi. Hello? Go ahead. I was just wanted to make yeah, I just wanted to make a comment. It seems they were speaking about roles and I find that in our community one of the biggest weaknesses right now, and that goes from the oldest to the youngest people, is that they've turned their raising the children into a job that lots of people like to quit, whereas before it used to be an honor. And we yeah. all knew our role at a certain age of uh, where we wouldn't have to step over our bounds or where we would actually come in and protect the children or else the children protect each other. So I was just going to make that comment is um, finding out what our roles are throughout the, the age groups would uh, settle a lot of these, um, the power uh, imbalance and the learning behaviors and the entitlement and all of that. And I like what the presenter said earlier, the value of our rites of passage again because the children have made their own rites of passage because we haven't shown them uh, that we've gone through that as well. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you. Oh my gosh. Love it, yes, thank love you. it. I love what you're saying. Um, absolutely, we have made the, the role, like father and mother has become a role, it's become a job. Um, as opposed to focusing on the relationship and you know there was a time where children you know mom and dad maybe could discipline a child and then there was always someone another adult grandma or grandpa or aunt or uncle uh, that could comfort the child and we were working together it, it, it you know to raise all of the children and and that saying it takes a village to raise a child I think is so very true we live in isolation these days mm -hmm. we're also sending our kids off we feel like experts teachers and other experts have more knowledge about how to raise our kids than we do <laughs> it's there's an instinct to parenting it can't be taught it is instinctive to care for each other and so we can teach a parent all kinds of parenting skills, but we can't teach a parent how to love. We can't teach a parent how to care. This is instinctive. If they've lost this, that's just a sign that there's some healing that needs to take place for them so that they can get their soft heart back and their instincts. We, human instincts, that's what we're talking about here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and the rites of passage, yeah, beautifully said. I just thank you so much. Um, so important to acknowledge that we had traditional ways of acknowledging development in our children and different stages and phases. And I know that um, my elder has told me that traditionally, you know, children were really kept uh, close. Uh, they really weren't sent out with anyone before the age of three, uh, and even then, um, who the child was introduced to was very specific. Um, there was just a, there was a timing to things. It wasn't this rush, rush, rush 
It's, we're not like, our kids aren't like baby birds. Push them out of the nest sooner and they'll develop, the, they'll get their wings. It doesn't really work that way. So, thank you. <clears throat> Shall we move on? Thank you. Hi, Chika. All right. So let's talk about this thing called lateral violence a little bit. And, you know, when I first started doing this work, it, it wasn't as much of a buzzword as it is now. It's really out there in a big way. It's almost become viral. Uh, and honestly, the term, I think, is it's not a very good term. I actually have decided that I'm going to do research on the roots of the term because I would like to know where it came from. But I think it's very confusing for people. I think that it's being used inappropriately. Uh, I think that um, it's become very sort of, um, like I said, it's a buzz word and we're using it to actually perpetuate the problem. And so I hope that I can give you some different language and some insight into this. Now one of the things that is difficult about this thing we call lateral violence that is that has people feeling like scratching their head, asking a lot of questions, and feeling like it's hard to address, it's hard to pinpoint, it is. Because how the heck are we supposed to define behaviors that we can't even measure? We cannot measure them. It, we can measure it psychologically, we can look at this psychologically, but we cannot measure it in terms of behaviors. Now, there's, di there's a difference between an act of violence and lat what we call lateral violence because often where there's, if someone comes up and punches me in the face or slashes my tires, there's a clear act of violence. There's a violation there. That's occurred. There's no argument about it. I can call the police, do a police report, and there's evidence there. But how are we supposed to measure daggers in somebody's eyes? How do we measure someone's gruff tone of voice? How do we measure someone shunning us or ignoring us? It is impossible to measure. And that's why when we talk about doing policies around this, when we talk about having a zero tolerance policy, it's almost, it, it's sort of like, how the heck could you control all of that in a day, in an organization, in a band office, in a community? You cannot control what you can't measure or catch. You can't reprimand someone for, for ignoring somebody else or for giving someone a dirty look. Does that make sense? That's true. <laughs> I, yeah, I guess I, I've seen it couched now in does my workplace feel safe? Is mm. it culturally safe? So yeah. that's the language. And what kinds of behaviors mm -hmm. um, facilitate a feeling of safety? Yeah. So it's not necessarily measuring violence, although you do see signs in our workplaces around what kinds of violence are acceptable or not acceptable, yes. you know, towards yeah. healthcare workers and others. Yeah. So a lot of people are talking about it, but clearly it's not addressing the problem very well because there's still an escalation in a lot of the difficulties, you know, in, in offices, in communities, in administrations. Um, it's just, and on the playground too. Right? If someone, if you're left out, if you're excluded, you can't make people like you. Mm -hmm. But you, you know, you can try to force people to be civil to one another. But you still know that that person doesn't like you. You see? Yeah. So it's it's a tough one, and I think that this, the fact that we can't measure it, is what makes it so frustrating. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> it's a frustrating thing. So when we think about, I, I often will think that these. These sort of behaviors happen in eruptions. And this is, I didn't label this one, but this is another Gordon Neufeld slide uh, from his Making Sense of Aggression uh, material that I'm authorized to facilitate. Yeah. And what we see are eruptions. Okay. I call these eruptions. And they show up in all different ways and forms, from an infant all the way through to elders. I mean, we have elders who are, are erupting out of frustration. And so you can see that some of these are, are sort of more outright and easy to identify. And then you can see that some of them would be very difficult to identify. Now, the difficulty here is that if, if we don't um, 
if we don't intervene, then certainly this stuff can escalate into violence. And I want to point out a couple of things here. That vicarious attacks, um, this is when we have people who are titillated by seeing, seeing someone else be hurt. So they're the bystanders. They're the bystanders, they're the ones that stand in the background and they are somehow get some sort of uh, titillation or enjoyment out of seeing someone else be hurt. Uh, vicarious attacks would also include um, kids or people who enjoy playing violent, violent video games um, or watching violent, violent movies. They're titillated by it. So what would, what would up, be upsetting for me and cause anxiety in me would be titillating for that person. That's what a vicarious attack is. Um, you also get violent fantasies, which is really where if you've ever had a dream, if you've ever had a dream about uh, strangling someone that you're frustrated with. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Chances are uh, that, that you've got some, some frustration there. Okay, and then the other the other piece is the self attack that I want to talk about, and that's where we see um, if it's not safe for someone uh, to have an eruption, that they'll take it out on themselves. Right. And so I will often tell people if someone's erupting on you, this is the good news and the bad news. If people in your community are having eruptions, it's a backhanded compliment because if you go to a community where it's like a flat line, there's often higher levels of suicide. The attempts at suicide, oh, really? yeah, and the things like burning and cutting will be higher. Yes. So it's like a, if someone can, can erupt on you like your daughter, yes. that's a backhanded compliment. Okay. That's safe for her. All right. A child or a person that doesn't feel safe, the anxiety outweighs the, first, like, the need to erupt, yeah. that they hold that in. Right. And it can come out on oneself or it can come out somewhere else. So I guess the process is just to help her erupt. In, so in a civilized manner, So it doesn't hopefully. make me erupt? <laughs> yes, because right? we've got to deal with our own frustration. Right? That's right. right. That's the challenge, When right? we're faced with all this stuff, um, we have to manage our own frustration. And, and Gordon said something to me one, said something to, I heard him say something once um, that, <laughs> oh, I wished he hadn't said it because it stuck with me. He said, the best, te the best test of our maturity is the way we respond to the immature. And I thought, oh, why did he have to say that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Darn it. Yeah. I, I can't get that out of my head now, right? Mm -hmm. So. These are called eruptions, and if we are witnessing someone who's in the throes of an eruption, whether it's a child, an adult, or an elder, it, trying to manage it at that point, trying to address it, trying to teach a lesson, at that point is the equivalent of trying to push hot lava back into a volcano. Yes. Yeah. Don't do it. it it's, you're, you're, you're not addressing the problem now. Yeah. This is the incident. The, the root problem is something very, very different. Yes. These, these are, are symptoms of something that is deeper, yeah. that needs addressing. And so we can't solve the problem by addressing the behaviors. Mm -hmm. We just can't. Um, I just have a beautiful comment here. Mm -hmm. It says, um, we have to learn to dance with our own shadows. Yes. Oh. Beautiful. That's of course, beautiful. Sue would say that. That's gorgeous. And um, Bernadette asks, how do we manage eruptions yeah. on Facebook? Yeah. Oh, gosh, Facebook. Huh. <laughs> you know, yeah. Facebook is... <laughs> David Suzuki has said that it takes any society about 200 years to integrate new technology to see the results of it now yeah to really fully integrate as a society any new technology wow to see the real effects of it and so think about that for a minute how we've been taken by storm by social media totally 
And the problem with this is that we have no cultural scripts for it. There's no, it has no, um, it has shown no moral conscience. It is not facilitating healthy relationships that are intergenerational. It is facilitating superficial relationships and it's a free for all. And the other thing is, is that never before have we had 24 seven access to our peer group. Yeah. We had a break from this. Our children had a break from this. They don't have a break. It is incessant. It's true. Yeah, it is. And so, again, putting some sort of boundaries around this. Yeah. There are no cultural scripts. Traditionally, we had what's called cultural scripts for things. When we do this, this is what happens. If this happens, this is what we do. And at this point, we do this. And everyone was speaking the same language. Yeah. Everyone in the village were, were saying the same things about how we live and treat each other. Now, we don't have that anymore because we don't have an attachment village. And so we have, you know, with globalization, there's such diversity and it is a free for all in terms, not in all cultures. Mm -hmm. But it, in some cultures and in North America, it is a free for all in terms of the way we're living. Yes, because it there, it's a melting pot of messages. Our kids and we are getting so many different messages about how to live. It is so confusing. Yeah. Who do we choose to listen to? Yeah. And so how do we, how do we provide messaging about the use of social media? I mean, it's gotten away on us. Yeah. It has so gotten away on us, I don't even know what to say about it. Those are good questions, though. Just oh. even to ask those questions and to understand that maybe... Um, Fantastic. <laughs> well, I guess that's an opportunity, if, if you have the opportunity to early, is to actually decide on boundaries yeah. then, as at least family units, and maybe even as a community you might be able to do that, like maybe from this time to that time. Mm -hmm. We're off it unless it's an emergency or something like that. I don't know. Now, something. yeah, I, well, I think you're thinking in the, like, I like what you're saying. I think your thinking's right around that. And mm -hmm. I think that if, if um, we are in good relationship, if we have deep attachment roots in our relationships with our parents, our grandparents, our cousins, our children, that we will seek out that personal contact over yep. superficial hits yep. on Facebook. Right. This is the problem. We have lost those deep, intimate relationships with each other, and so we're seeking out little hits, yeah. worth nuggets, hits on Facebook to try and get that preeminent need for attachment met. Yeah. It's, Gordon calls it attachment technology, and he said that's why it swept everybody by storm, because it provided uh, a low-risk way of connecting. It's very low risk yeah, compared right. to the real thing. But look at what's happening. It's become high risk. Yeah. Well, the bullying, and we've had kids that have killed themselves over yeah. it. Mm -hmm. But I just listened to someone talk about this the other day about to, uh, Amanda Todd. Remember Amanda yes, Todd? Yes, yes. And the dad had said, you know, if she had just come to me, I would have helped her. If she had just come to me, I loved my daughter. And the truth was, though, is that she was peer attached and she wouldn't have thought to come to her father because she was no longer seeking comfort from her parents. Mm -hmm. She was seeking it from her peers. And she went to her peers um, showing her vulnerability and seeking sympathy and peers did what hardened peers will do and they bullied her. They took that information and they turned it against her. And so you can see that the root problem is a child who's well attached, a person who's well attached, who has deep attachments, it wouldn't feel natural to put yourself in a group of people that would be hurtful to you. Yeah. You would just naturally gravitate away from that to another, to a safer place. But our kids aren't. They're putting themselves in harm's way. Mm -hmm. And we're thinking that this is part of development. Right. Yeah. Right. Thank you. All right. How much time do we have? Oh, yeah. All right. <laughs> I know. I know. We have about a half an hour. Okay. Yeah. All right. Let's get to the, what people showed up for here, okay. the, the Great. lateral line Thank stuff. Thank you. Um, so I want to define um, aggression because when we talk about lateral violence, to me it's an aggression problem, and it's a problem managing aggression, okay? Um, it doesn't have to do with the power imbalance, and it, it doesn't have to do with, you know, a learned behavior. But if you think about to aggress, 
to aggress is an energy that moves in us, and so something triggers it, and then we feel this this energy come up. Now, it doesn't always result in an attack, the volcano, the attacks. Um, it can, mm -hmm. but it doesn't always. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we have that that impulse, and we check ourselves, and we manage it, and and uh, but it can, and so we feel this movement, and many things can trigger that in us. Many many things can trigger it, trigger it. Uh, but it is the impulse to attack. And there has been lots of research and theorizing around this as well, that attack is only um, one of the outcomes. Right. It's only one. There's two other alternate outcomes um, that we need to be looking at in terms of facilitating change around this. Okay? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so... I said this before, aggression and violence can happen without any measurable violation occurring, and it can certainly escalate into violence, like to a violation, mm -hmm. something measurable. I want to, so I want to ask people a question. What are some of the things that move us to attack? And if you think about the volcano with all the eruptions coming out, mm -hmm. what are some of the things that move us to attack? Why would we ignore somebody? Why would we give a dirty look? Why would we say something mean about somebody? We have someone on webinar saying fear. Great. Definitely. Absolutely. Fear moves. When I feel afraid, certainly I can I can move into, I can feel that energy coming up in me. Mm -hmm. yeah. What else? I, I would actually have to say, I was just thinking about some of my behavior recently, and it's usually around, it, it could be fear. It, it also could be around not, um, maybe not feeling attached, feeling like someone is doing something that will disrupt my sense of connection Good. to them, Good. right? Good. That's very astute of you. Is it? Yes, absolutely. Right. Yeah, I'm going to get there in a minute. But yeah, that's very, very astute. Okay. Yeah. And we have here a couple more unsafe and insecure. Absolutely. When we're feeling unsafe, when we're feeling insecure, Mm -hmm. Anything else um, on video conference? Any? Hello? Hi. A lot of the times uh, they're going to feel as if they're going to get attacked, so they'll do the attack first. Right? They're feeling vulnerable, okay. yeah. They're anticipating. I, that's wonderful. Thank you. They're anticipating. Someone, you know, when we're anticipating being hurt, Emotionally or psychologically, absolutely, that will move us to attack. Yeah. We yeah. also have jealousy, revenge, yep. feeling threatened, intimidation. Yes. Now think about all the things that you've just mentioned. They are all to do with facing separation. Mm. They are all relational. That's true. <laughs> yeah. When our relationships don't work. And that could even just be me sitting across from you trying to explain myself to you and me feeling misunderstood would move me in this way. Yeah. Yep. So it can be from the smallest thing yes. to something that's more, more overt and big, like someone cutting me off in traffic or someone doing something mean to me yes. um, or an injustice of some sort where I feel like that's not fair and it need, justice needs to be served, all of those sorts of things. We could sit here and brainstorm, listen, listen, less. Okay? Totally. But they're generally all to do with relationship stuff yeah. where we're facing separation of some sort. Now... The root of aggression, okay, the root of all aggression and violence is very, very simple, and there's all sorts of research on this as well, and it might be surprising for you, but the root of all aggression is frustration. Frustration is a root emotion. There's three root emotions we have, really? um, absolutely, that all mammals have. Frustration, it's what makes elephants stampede. It, what, it's what make, makes a cat scratch, a dog bite. It is frustration. And so when something's not working, this is the language that I want you to adopt around this, and you want to write it down because I don't have it on the slide. We become frust frustration happens to us when something's not working. When anything's not working. Of course. My yeah. computer's not working, and I'm late for this presentation, and I'm trying to get my 
presentation up, I get frustrated. Yeah. A child doesn't get their way, they get frustrated. Yeah. Now, think about all the things intergenerationally that haven't worked for our people. Think about it. Think about how much hasn't worked and how much today the frustrations we're still coping with in terms of poverty, um, the social challenges, addictions, all of that. So very, very much. And so often in wounded populations, there's higher levels of frustration. Autistic children have higher levels of frustration. There's more things that aren't working for that person. And so what happens is frustration is existential, which means it's part of everyday life, everyday life. And um, frustration happens to us. It's a triggered impulse. And so it is so important that we make space for this, that we start to develop a language for it, and we start to make space for it. We can't manage an emotion that we don't acknowledge. Right. And because we live in a world of have, wanting things to have be neat and tidy and role-based, that in that role there's no room for that emotion, that we've got a lot of people with a lot of pent-up frustration. Yeah. And I'm going to use a really gross analogy that Dr. Neufeld uses, but it's so effective, so please forgive me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> you guys are looking at each other. It's nothing too, too bad. But frustration, what the body doesn't need, it must rid itself of. And every day we wake up and we have frustration that happens and it needs to come out. Right. Okay? If it doesn't come out... We're going, to have an, we're going to have an eruption. <laughs> okay. It, right. Pretty much. Okay. <laughs> so it's kind of like a bowel movement, and what we're doing to each other is this. This is what we're doing to each other. You think that's cute, eh? Um, and to our children is we're saying, good for you. You haven't had a bowel movement in 10 days. If you go another day, you're going to get an award for that. Good job. Hold on to that frustration a little longer. As opposed to helping people develop ways... <laughs> Of letting it out. Wow. Right? Wow. Yeah. 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 So we're going at it. And so that's why we've got we've got all sorts of people with repressed frustration and it's coming out, it's leaking out in all sorts of ways. It affects our health. I know. Let's go move away from that, <laughs> that analogy. analogy. Oh my god. But it's affecting our health. We've yeah. got the girls cutting and burning themselves. That's a frustration problem. Mm -hmm. We've got kids talking about killing themselves, attempting to kill themselves, you know, high risk behavior. It's frustration. All of it stems from frustration, and then we've got we've got the sarcasm and the you know the snide remarks and the foul moods and all of this stuff. It, and so here's the thing: is we can actually be frustrated without knowing it. If there's been no room for us, we will be carrying all this frustration around, and you'll say, "Well, are you, how are you? Are you okay? Is everything okay? What are you talking about? Mm -hmm. I'm fine." Yeah, I know many people like this, and so we can be frustrated without without knowing it. And I can be, and I get really agitated and irritable, and I mm -hmm. I'm full of frustration that's turned foul, and I'm completely oblivious. Mm -hmm. And I can end up in an eruption of aggression towards my spouse, towards my kids, mm -hmm. towards a colleague, towards myself. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I know that for most of you out there that are close to your instincts, you'll be, uh, you should be shaking your head saying, yes, this makes sense. Yeah, I recognize it for sure. Yeah, absolutely. So the idea here is that we would adopt a language for frustration. We'd be teaching our children how to manage it. Um, we, would be, we would be talking about the frustrations and finding civilized ways, civilized outlets, so it doesn't have to turn into aggression. Yeah. Punching My pillows. goodness. Dancing, Absolutely. Writing in journals. Screaming. Screaming. Talking about things. Being able to even say, I feel frustrated. This is so not working for me. Yeah. Now, what do you think the number one thing we need to work is, based on everything I've said? The number one what? The number one thing that we need as human beings, as mammals, to work is our relationships. Is our relationships. Right. And what is the number one thing that's not working for most of us? Our, our relationships. relationships. Yeah, but we've law we've moved away from our instincts. We think it's everything else. Mm -hmm. We think it's our low bank account, or we think it's the fact that we're not succeeding at work, or um, you know, all of these other things. We think it's the person that's it's cut us off in traffic. You know, when I get cut off in traffic and I give the you know the universal sign of aggression, <laughs> um, 
you know, I'm forgetting that my husband and I have not been talking for a week because of a problem we're having. Mm -hmm. And it has nothing to do with the incident in front of me. And so we're dealing with a high level of frustration. This is normal. And we need to come at it differently. To say to someone, your frustration will not be tolerated here, is only going to make the problem worse. And it's coming out in funny ways as opposed to coming out directly. Now, do we want to have people showing up at work, erupting at work? Probably not. Mm -hmm. But we can help develop um, the capacity um, for people to find more civilized, civilized ways of managing frustration that don't include repressing it. I want to differentiate um, aggression from anger. And again, this comes from Dr. Gordon Neufeld. We have to kind of know what emotion we're dealing with in order to appropriately respond to it. So frustration is experienced by all creatures of emotion, all creatures with the limbic system, mammals. It's evoked by something not working. It's a root emotion that can exist without being felt, and it triggers the impulse to attack. And you will all know people that are full of foul frustration, and they are ready to attack, and full of attack, and they are spoiling for a fight 24-7. Mm -hmm. We all know those people. They're just, it feels like everything that comes out of their mouth, they're spoiling for a fight. Mm -hmm. It's like, whoa, that is one frustrated person. Now, the difference between frustration and anger is you can, you can um, be frustrated without ever being angry, but you can never be angry without first being frustrated. Okay? Anger is only experienced by humans. It is evoked by a perceived injustice of some sort. So we have to be able to perceive not fair, not right. Just so you know, children under the age of five, they don't have any blood flow to the prefrontal cortex till about five or older, so they can't be angry. They can't perceive an injustice. It is pure frustration. Mm -hmm. It in, so it involves this part of the brain, high, the higher development, and a, and a consciousness. <clears throat> and it triggers the impulse to seek justice. Okay? Mm -hmm. So we have to know, are we dealing with someone who's angry? Are we dealing with someone who's just darn frustrated here? Because honestly, we can come alongside frustration. If you're frustrated and I say, it's, clearly something's not working for you, let me help you. What is it that's not working? If I can help you, I will. We can say that to a child, let me help you, you're frustrated. But if I perceive you as angry, do you see how that changes the dance with people? If I perceive you as angry, all of a sudden it's like, what an angry person you are. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's very easy to polarize against, against that energy. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean that we don't ever get angry, but if we're managing our frustration, we can certainly bring our anger forth in a more constructive way as well. Mm -hmm. That makes sense? I think so. Yeah. Do you have I a question? So. Ask me some questions about it if it's not making sense. Because there's a lot of talk about anger and anger management. And what research is this based on is a question from the web. Um, most of it is Dr. Gordon Neufeld's research, but it is brain science, neuroscience. So they can take pictures of the brain to see exactly what's happening in there. And so there are three root emotions in, that, in the limbic system that we all have, all mammals have, and it is, it is a triggered impulse, whereas anger just, we, this part of the brain is being used. Frustration, the more primitive part of the brain. Mm. Interesting. Anything else? Any other questions? Let's move on because we only have... Fifteen minutes. Okay. So what tends to happen is that when we are experiencing aggression, frustration, something not working, aggression or an eruption, we tend to, and I know I myself do this, add the, di the dynamic of blame. Mm -hmm. And we get into this circular conversation either in ourselves or with other people around us where we sort of do this little dance. We dance ourselves around and we dance each other around. And we go from anger, which is it's your fault, to guilt, which is it's my fault, mm -hmm. to shame, there's something wrong with me. And that is not an effective way to manage or work with frustration because it actually, for me, it makes me more frustrated. Mm -hmm. 
And so again, coming back to this idea that we have to actually make room for our frustration. We have to be able to, first of all, express our frustration, identify it, name it, work with it. Because mm -hmm. we can't manage an emotion we're not conscious of. Yeah. It has nothing to do with any of those internal or external conversations where we're, you know, judge, jury, yep. detective, judge, and jury. Right. And this, these are the conversations I see happening a lot. Yes. Yeah. So we talked about this, what frustrates us the most. It's simple when we face separation in any form. And there they are again. Right. This is what frustrates us the most. Not feeling wanted. Yeah. Sorry about that. Is there a typo there? Yeah. It's all right. Darn we it. know what it means. Wanted. Not, yeah. wa not waned. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Um, we talked about this already, peer orientation is a major source of wounding and a recipe for violence. I thought that would picture was so apropos. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it, peer, there's no room for vulnerability. There's no room for tears. There's no room for soft emotions. Uh, there's no room for being different. And I heard uh, I, one of my uh, instructors at the Newfield Institute, um, I was on having in a session last night and she was talking about bullying which I'm going to be talking about next month um, and she was saying how it can happen in terms of she was talking about young girls in school like 11 year old girls and um, that you know the one girl that's sort of the dominant one becomes the queen bee and she's orchestrating all the other ones around her and um, the one little girl that loves art um, that doesn't have a lot of money and she has to make a choice about what she's going to spend her money on, she buys, instead of buying the hip shoes or the what, whatever it is that the group is wearing, she goes and makes a choice to buy crayons or art supplies. And to the queen bee, that is a show of defiance. Mm -hmm. That's a demonstration of defiance. And it evokes this instinct to just, that vulnerability there that invo evokes this instinct to just crush that. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden, this other little one's being alienated and ostracized, and everyone's going, well, I don't know what happened. I don't understand how they were fine last yesterday, and now all of a sudden. And it can be that. That's how um, wounding that environment can be. Mm -hmm. And it's all, it's all based on those super superficial forms of attachment. So in a nutshell, we have to be able to move from mad to sad, around the things that don't work, can't work, won't work. Mm -hmm. And that little journey um, of tears is how we develop resilience and adaptive functioning. And so there is a institute, I believe it's in Minnesota, they study tears. And there's a certain kind of a tear, they've measured the content. Um, so not tears of joy and not tears of still trying to get her own way, but those deep tears, <laughs> deep tears of resignation that we have. They have they're t they have they're more toxic. There's a there's a higher level of protein or something, and it's those tears that when we rele release those tears, this part of the brain they can see it growing and it shears off what hasn't worked, and they now know that this is how we learn best. It it was once believed that we learned through what did work. When we figured out what worked, they now know that we learn and adaptive functioning is developed in the brain when we experience what doesn't work and we come to a place of resignation around what won't work, can't work, will never work. And we feel our disappointment or sadness. We have our vulnerable emotion around it. Mm -hmm. And we let go. And the brain just shears that off and finds a different way. And it doesn't keep trying to do that. So my question is whether that can also come as a response to a dysfunctional relationship that's not working. And you can harden because of that. I think we harden, well, if we, yeah, that's a, I could say a lot about that. I'm mindful of time, but yeah. certainly if we have become hardened yeah. growing up, the brain, that adaptive functioning doesn't develop, so we get atrophying up there. Yeah. Um, and so we get stuck in this, what's called perceptive behavior, so we continue to make the same mistakes and we don't learn from our mistakes. Mm. Hey, 
I'm there sometimes around certain things. There's just, it's like I can't learn that I can't eat bags of chips at night without my pants getting too tight. Mm -hmm. Okay? Yeah. Right? Yeah. That's something very simple. We all, yeah. a lot of us grapple with that one. Totally. But there's something about that that I'm not, I'm not getting, I'm not adapting around this. Um, but certainly we harden up and we become desensitized and now we can tolerate that bad relationship. It becomes normalized to us. Mm -hmm. Now something shifts and all of a sudden our heart starts to thaw out. We start to heal and now this is no longer acceptable to us. Mm -hmm. And we start to have our tears around what didn't work and we become more adaptive and resilient and, and we this is how we heal and we grow. But you can see how we could certainly stay in a relationship that's abusive. If we grew up in a very wounding environment, we will seek out those relationships. We will seek that out. It's normal for us. Mm -hmm. So what, what we can't change should change us, and that's how I describe and how Dr. Newfeld describes adaptive functioning, and so important, and we need to be building this into our children, young, 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 and there's all sorts of things we can be doing. And for those of us that are older, it's never too late. That's the beauty of it. It doesn't mm -hmm. matter how stuck we've been, how hardened we've been, the tra tragedies we've lived through, there's always an opportunity for us to grow and you know I want to say that my grandpa passed away last May he was 94 mm. and he was a tough old bird he had uh, he was a fisherman he'd fished the West Coast his whole life <coughs> his name was Bob Finley and he was a tough old bird he was a survivor he'd been through a lot in his life he wasn't an emotional man mm. and it was on his deathbed that he got his heart softened and he got his tears back. And it was on his way out of this world, it was leaving the physical world that he, he softened. It was amazing. So I say like, you just, we can't put a timeline, we, we're so stuck on development being like... Linear. And it's just, you just don't know what it will look like. We talked about this already. Um, all the different frustrations that we uh, face in our communities, the things that don't work, uh, can't work, will never work, the things that have happened that we can't change. I think that that's such a big part of the healing process and I think that that's why the apology that came from the government was so important because it was an acknowledgement and now our work is to is okay, to, feel, what? <laughs> to feel our feelings yeah. around yeah. it and, yeah. and to and to he begin to heal from, from that. The acknowledgement that this happened, it can't be taken back and that we can't turn back time. And we're still seeing all of the frustrating uh, events um, trickling trickling down from that still. Oh yeah. And so the frustration is still there. We're reminded all the time. That's right. Oh. And our some of my relatives didn't want to be reminded because yes. they had kind of lock that stuff away right? absolutely yeah. absolutely it's it's too painful and I and I think that's why it's we have to be so careful with that I want to have to I think sometimes we can re-traumatize people and that will harden them further mm -hmm. not soften them mm -hmm. it, we can't force a healing process on people and I know that you know we have so many wonderful programs out there but we have to the timing has to be right for people mm -hmm. And last but not least, um, next month when I'm back, I will be talking about bullying in particular mm -hmm. and how uh, the bully gets to be the way they are and what the resolutions are uh, and how to make sense of that. And it's fascinating. Uh, for me, as I was learning it, I was like, oh my goodness, there actually is a fine line between that strong, caring, alpha leader type person and the bully and I know for me I'm very what's called what we call in at the Newfield Institute alpha which means I'm that strong sort of like care giving person um, if I if I sense any vulnerability or if anyone needs anything I just gravitate towards it's instinctual for me to want to provide to yes. help mm -hmm. now get me when I'm a little hardened and I'm frustrated and I'm having a bad day and things aren't working in my life and it can be a little scary honestly because <laughs> the bigness is still there but the caring's now gone yeah right right 
and so it just gets a little twisted. Uh, so I'm, that's my presentation Next in a time. nutshell. That's so great. Can <laughs> I ask a question? And then um, there's questions for everyone yeah. out there, please, or on the webinar. But I guess I know you've provided us with a map, and you've given us some answers. And um, some of us are trying to think about, okay, so how do I apply that to my own life? Mm -hmm. And what kinds of things could I um, do? How could I be present with this in mm -hmm. my organization or yes. where I work or in my community? What kinds of things could I do to create a safe environment or mm -hmm. to create a place where attachment can happen? So if I would love to just hear about your thoughts on that and what you've seen, how yeah. that's been exhibited just as um, just to maybe generate some discussion, but also that question for those of us out there. Yeah, that's a big question. I do not recommend that people try to implement change. I think sometimes we learn something, we get excited, and we want to move in quickly to implement change. And I recommend with this information, it's an insight approach. And so I think the best advice I can give you <coughs> is to allow what I've shared with you to inform what you're seeing out there. See things differently. Challenge yourself when you make an assumption about something to look at it differently. And from there, because the, the, your response should be intuitive and, and you should come to your own, to your own um, solutions around things. And, and I think the more you can learn about this stuff, the more you can sit down and have informed meetings where we're not making false assumptions about things is so important. Um, I do hear, because we're, as humans, we like to make meaning, we do not like uncertainty, we will often look at a situation and we will jump to a conclusion just so we can have an answer about it. Right. And we move too quickly. We just move way too quickly. And we make poor decisions and we make more of a mess. And so I'm just, I would suggest, and this is where I frustrate people, <laughs> step back create space and start to question your own scene, your thinking and seeing <coughs> and allow that to inform you. And I think it's okay to be in the I don't know of things. We do not spend enough time there. With Google, it's like if I anyone want the has a question. Now. Well you know what? My son asked me the other day, Mom, what's vinegar made out of? We were at dinner. I was at dinner with my two sons. What's vinegar made out of? And I thought I thought I knew the answer to that, but I'm not quite sure. And I, I the impulse to grab my phone, to yeah. Google it, and I thought, no, this is a great conversation. Let's be curious about what vinegar's made out of it, and let's talk about it. That's right, yeah. And we had this wonderful conversation about all the different things vinegar could be made of, which we wouldn't have had if I had had the answer to the question. Right. And we moved too quickly for answers. And I think, if you even think traditionally, much of the time spent in circle dialoguing, it wasn't about answers. Yeah. It was about questions, and it was about looking at things differently and being together and understanding, and from there, finding. And the relationships among yes. us as we yes. were in answering the questions, of yes. course. Yes. Yeah, and then finding sustainable solutions to our problems, because you know what? You know your community best. You know your people best. Mm. You're their best bet. You're their best bet. Not third-party experts, not necessarily me, but you. And, and that, to me, is true capacity building. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Hi, Chika. That's a good answer. Any questions from the field out there? We have a question, where can we get a copy of the presentation? And it is on the Learning Circle uh, website, so the presentation is there as well. So you can look to that. We will get Denise back next month as well. Um, any closing comments or thoughts? I have one comment here. My shadow is my best teacher. <laughs> How is that to be compassionate with yourself, hey? Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. We all have the dark energy. Oh, yeah. We do. Yeah. And uh, I think that's something I might talk about when I talk about the bullying stuff is the dark energy of attachment. Mm -hmm. Okay? Mm-hmm. So Bernadette asks, 
I don't know if it's a question, it's a comment. I'm just going to try to read it. How we are from a learned behavior, from relationship base to our present. Is that a question or a comment? It might be a comment. It resonates. It I mean, resonates, yeah. It's, yeah. Well, like I said, we cannot teach caring. It is a human instinct. We're born so vulnerable. It's, the, it's our experiences that harden us up and we lose that instinct, so. Hi, Chika, everyone. Um, thank you for, um, again, once again, to acknowledge you and your good work. And uh, looking forward to seeing you again. We have a circle on Thursday on feeding our babies, traditional ways of feeding our babies. And uh, more circles coming next week. So I'm looking forward to seeing you then. I think Gathering Wisdom is next week. So it's a conference for our youth. So I imagine our youth are going to be there. Is that next week? Oh, Gathering Our Voices. Sorry, that's right. Gathering Our Voices, which is downtown Vancouver, which will be exciting.